Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part 20 of Uzumaki Naruto, Birth of the New Demon King. If you guys enjoy this what if, and want to see part 21 of it, comment down below, and let me know. The let goal for this video is 200 likes. So like this video, to let me know that you're interested in this series, and you want the next part. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. Several days before Naruto and company reached Tetsu no Kuni. You can't be serious. Kurenai practically shouted, her eyes going so wide they looked as if they might simply roll out of her sockets, such was her shock. As things stood, only the ceiling tag with the complicated silencing seal under the table, kept her shout from being heard by everyone in the bar. Are you really asking us to share Naruto with you? Why would you even ask something like that? Kyubi frowned, not quite seeing what the problem was. Sure, most human relationships tended to be monogamous, but, as had been proven when the council wanted to use Naruto as breeding stock, they did have some cases in which a human might marry multiple women. She opened her mouth to ask what Kurenai's problem was when said woman stood up, and slammed her hands on the table. The chair under her scooted several inches back, and almost tipped onto the floor. While no one actually heard the act, everyone saw it and their eyes couldn't help, but be drawn towards the conflict. The fact that no one could hear anything being said, or done there only added confusion to the scene. Did Naruto put you up to this, asked Kurenai, anger suddenly appearing in her eyes. He did, didn't he? And here I thought he was a decent human being. I guess I was wrong, he's just like every other ma. If you finish that sentence I will rip out your tongue. Kyubi threatened with a snarl, as she too slammed her hands on the table and stood up, so she could get face to face with Kurenai. The chair behind her did tip over, spilling to the floor as the red-haired beauty's beautiful red lips peeled back to show off incredibly sharp canines. Speak ill of my maid again, and I will ensure that you won't be able to use that treasonous mouth anymore. Kurenai reeled back in not only shock, but also fear. She had never heard the young woman use such a tone before, it was not only a lot deeper, but sounded more guttural, and had an unusual amount of killing intent behind it. Only a hard-earned sense of spatial awareness allowed her to find her seat and sit down, her body beginning to shake in unknown fear. Apparently satisfied that she had scared the woman into submission, Kyubi nodded her head and sat down as well. Her voice also went back to normal. Take heed of my words, Kurenai-san, for I will not give a second warning. I will not have you speak ill of my mate. Now, you will stay in your seat, shut up, and listen to me. Is that clear? Kyubi gave Kurenai a pointed look, punctuating her last three words. Still reeling from the shock of what just happened, Kurenai was only able to nod. Good, Kyubi smiled, seemingly pleased before her tone took on a more businesslike quality. First things first then. Since you seemed so adamant on laying the blame for my proposal on Naruto. Naruto, she hastily corrected herself. Thankfully, the two women seemed to be in far too much shock to notice her small slip up. I believe I should inform you, that the idea for Naruto, to have more than one mate was not his, it was mine. Wait. Unko shouted suddenly, breaking out of her own measure of shock. She received an annoyed glare from Kyubi at interrupting, but managed to keep from doing anything more than feeling a mild shudder run down her body as she continued. What do you mean this was your idea? Why would you, not only allow you, mate to have more than one um, girlfriend, but also suggest it? My reasons for this are my own, Kyubi determined with an even more point glare and a burst of brief, but intense killing intent. Unko shrank back, and the red hat almost smiled. Killing intent from a demon, was far more potent than anything a human could unleash. And I won't tell either of you, unless it becomes necessary. Suffice to say, I have many reasons for suggesting this. Second, neither of you will inform Naruto of this conversation. While well, we talked this over, and he agreed with me, I didn't tell him that I would be having this conversation with you too. If he finds out that I suggested this before he had a chance to speak with either of you, he will not be very pleased with me. That was something of an understatement. While Naruto had never said anything about this, he had mentioned that he would be talking to the girls they had decided would be allowed to enter the fold so to speak. Kyubi knew that while Naruto had never mentioned it, that he wanted to be the one to talk to them and ease them into the idea of becoming a part of what was essentially a harem. So yes, he was going to be pretty mad if he found out. Of course, he would only stay mad for a little while. Much as Naruto may try to deny it, he could never stay angry at Kyubi for too long. Despite being a demon, the one thing that had not really changed was his kindness. His personality had just gotten some more sarcastic and sadistic add-ons recently. Nothing too serious, just so I won't be taking any shit from you people any more kind of changes. In Kyubi's opinion, that was a good thing. Then why are you telling us, asked Kurenai, seemingly much calmer than a few seconds ago. Most of that was a ploy, Kyubi knew, she could feel the woman's emotions broiling just underneath the surface. As a demon, it was always easier for her to sense negative emotions in people. Because the decision to include you two was my own, Kyubi admitted, surprising the pair. 
Well, I've spoken with him in detail about this subject, neither of us have actually talked about who we want to join us. Both of us have already made several concessions of what requirements there are to join us, and you two are the only ones within this village that meet those requirements. There was a distinct pause before the Red Hat continued. Sanade does as well, but Naruto doesn't like her due to the way they first met. Neither Unko or Kurenai seemed surprised by that. And why should they? It was highly likely that Hana had told them about Naruto's first meeting with Tsunade and the subsequent argument that followed. And while there was no real hostility between them anymore, her mate still didn't hold a lot of respect for Tsunade. Well, you also have to factor in the age difference, right? Said Anko as she placed her left forearm on the table and leaned forward. I mean, as I can understand, the metaphorical vixen pointed at herself and Kuranai to emphasize her point. I'm only 9 years older than Naruto, and Kuranai is a little older than that, but not by much. Tsunade Sama is what? 53. 54 years old. 51, Kyubi supplied, smirking. Many people would probably wonder how she knew of the woman's age, especially since she always kept up that henge. From the looks Anko was giving her, the young snake mistress was definitely among those who were curious. Too bad she had no intention of revealing how she knew that knowledge to anyone. At least, not right now. It wouldn't do to tell people that she had been sealed into the woman's grandmother during Hashirima's fight with Madara at the Valley of the End. And age isn't really that big a concern for someone like Naruto, Kyubi continued, ignoring the odd looks her statement received from the two women. A smirk came to her face as she thought of what would happen if Tsunade actually did mate with her Naruto. While neither were sure if mating to the blonde descendant of Raisin would actually make the human woman immortal, at the very least there would be massive benefits, not just an increase in strength. It was also very likely that the act of Naruto mating with a woman would de-age them, or at the very least make them look younger. Then that henge Tsunade wears would be practically useless. It was an amusing thought, knowing that the vain woman may very well jump at the chance to be with Naruto, if she knew that there was a good chance of her becoming younger from it. And why wouldn't age be an important factor to Naruto, asked Anko, frowning a bit. I know that age isn't as big of a deal for shinobi as it is civilians, but Tsunade Sam is old enough to be his grandma. What's this about someone being old enough to be Naruto's grandma? Anko froze, her eyes widening like those of a frightened rabbit staring into the barrel of a shotgun. Those same eyes, with dilated pupils, looked over to Kuranai's equally white eyes. Tsunade Sama is right behind me, isn't she? A nod. Crap. Turning ever so slowly, Anko soon found herself staring into the angry half lidded eyes of a very drunken Senju Tsunade. Um, hey, Tsunade Sama, Anko greeted nervously. She scratched the back of her head as a smile made to hide her fright crept onto her face. Fancy meeting you her. Aha, ha 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 ha. She trailed off when the woman gave her a smile that almost made the younger Takabetsu Jonin nearly shit herself. Yes, quite a coincidence, isn't it? Tsunade replied conversationally, nodding to Kuranai and Kyubi in greeting before the once more landed on Anko. Now what's this about me being old enough to be Naruto's grandma? Anko began sweating as Tsunade leaned forward with a pleasant smile on her face, one that promised immeasurable amounts of pain to Anko, whether or not she got all of the questions Tsunade posed to her right. Anko wished she could bolt, unfortunately, Tsunade was not the strongest Kanoichi in Kanoha for nothing. So it looked like she was stuck there for the time being. Throughout all this, only one thought came to her mind. And it was not pleasant. Oh shit, I am so screwed. Birth of the new Demon King. Anko and Kurenai walked together on their way home in silence. They usually did this whenever they went out, being best friends and all. It wouldn't do for one of them, Anko, to be too drunk that any wannabe Casanova could take advantage of them. The fact that they were also next-door neighbors living in the same apartment complex helped since neither one of them had to actually go out of there in order to walk the other home. It wasn't even 15 minutes after the pair had bolted out of the bar like two bats out of hell. Given that an enraged Sanade had nearly destroyed the table they were sitting at in her drunken rage, and likely would have had it not been for Kit holding the woman back, all three had been surprised at the woman's strength, they thought she was a civilian, even Sanade, they felt it would be best if they beat a hasty retreat. Sometimes a tactical withdrawal is the best method for avoiding an unfortunate end. Neither of them had realized how late it was, the sun had set some time ago, leaving only a dark blue, almost black sky with a sparse twinkling of stars, and the light of the full moon smattering the sky like a master painter's canvas. Their feet walked the well-maintained road back to their apartment, neither one talking for the time being. Both were content to let the silence build for now, their minds locked onto their own thoughts of the proposal Kid had given them just half an hour ago. It would be very inefficient to say that both were stunned. Shock might be a good word, but even that would not be enough to convey the depths of their feelings on the matter. Neither one of them really knew what to think. It was surprising enough that they would have someone with enough balls to ask them to join a harem, the fact that it was a woman, and that said woman was the one who actually came up with the idea, was, for lack of a better word, stupefying. Kuranai, Anko knew, found the entire situation especially appalling. 
Well, Anka was not the slut everyone made her out to be. She was a lot more open-minded than her straight-laced friend. Kurnai would never even have sex with a man, unless they were married. She may be convinced to let that rule slide, if they were engaged, but even that was only after the male in question, had committed himself to her. For someone like her raven-haired friend, the idea of sharing a man with multiple women was deplorable, and demeaning on the women in question. As for herself, Anko was having her own internal debate. However, it was more a matter of expressing her already confirmed decision out loud than actually coming to a decision. She just hoped her friend would be accepting of her decision, or at least tolerant of it. I'm going to do it. Kurenai turned to her friend, shocked, she didn't need to be a genius, to know what her friend was talking about. Why? She asked, her voice sounding as confused as it was angry. Why would you allow yourself to be? Don't, Night chan Anko interrupted the woman before a tirade began, her head shaking back and forth. Just don't. I know what you want to say, and I know what you think of this, but I feel differently on the matter. Kurenai frowned, she'll attempt to say something, but remained silent out of respect for her friend. She would at least listen to Anko's thoughts before sharing her own. You know me, Nai Chan, Anko continued in a soft, almost sad voice. Probably better than anyone. You know how I'm treated by a majority of the male population, even many of the ninja in this village dislike me because of that bastard. There was no need to elaborate, Kur and I knew very well who that bastard was. Even in death, Orchimaru's stain haunted Anko like a wraith, tainting her in the eyes of the village. Go on, Kur and I press. Anko sighed. No guy's going to want a meaningful relationship with someone like me. Most of the men treat me worse than a piece of meat. To them, I'm just an object, something to be used and thrown away when I'm no longer fuckable. Kurenai frowned at Anko's words. She would have likely said something to dispute them, but seeing as they were actually the truth, kept her mouth shut. Naruto-kun is the only male besides Sandayume sama who's ever treated me with anything other than scorn and derision. Hell, he's treated me even better than the old man, even though we just met a few weeks ago. Anko wrapped her arms around her frame, as if to ward off the night's show. When I'm with him, I don't have to hide my shame behind a cheerful personality and sadistic remarks. I can be myself, like when I'm with you. I had no idea he made you feel that way, Kurenai said in a surprise voice. I mean, I know that you two have become close. I saw him taking you to those Princess Gale movies, and I remember that time you and he fell asleep together on your couch. But I hadn't realized that he meant so much to me. Anko finished with a half smile. It disappeared a second later and she sighed. Yay. I'm surprised too. I haven't known him that long, but he's already become an important part of my life. It truthfully hadn't been that hard for them to become close. Naruto, even with his changes, especially with his changes, was a lot like her in many respects, and not just in that they were both, or had been in Naruto's case, hated. Their personalities were very similar, and meshed well with each other. That Naruto treated her like a woman, and respected Kinoichi only made it that much harder for her not to enjoy being in his presence. Did that mean she loved him? No, at least not yet. But they had a connection, that came from their past experiences and similar personalities. Kurenai sighed as she turned her eyes to Starry Night Sky. I would warn you about entering a relationship with him, she said at last. You already know my opinion on the matter, and while I don't know if I can blame Naruto for this, I don't think I can ever approve of Kitsen's proposal. However, without warning, Kurenai's eyes softened, and she looked at her friend. However, if this is truly what you want, then I will support you to the best of my abilities. Bunko smiled at her friend. Thanks, Night chan that means a lot to me. Kur and I returned her friend's smile. Together, they made their way to their apartment complex and parted ways. Anko made her way to her room, stripping her clothing as she went until she was only in her undergarments. Without ceremony, she fell on her bed, and was out like a light, the day's revelations making her too tired to do more than that. While asleep, she dreamed of a certain whiskered blonde. Birth of the New Demon King. One month later, Naruto, Minato and Jurei arrived in Kanoha nearly a month after they began negotiations with Inoki and Tetsu no Kuni. It had taken a long time to bargain a compromise that the old man had been willing to accept, compromise being a term that applied very loosely. The truth of the matter was, the old Sachikage had no choice, but to do agree to Minato's terms. While he was a prideful old man, he was also intelligent. The war against Kanoha, especially now that the village hidden in the leaves, not only had their Yuan Daime Hokage back, but also Jurei, Sanade, Saratobi and Naruto, 5S rank ninja of incredible talent and prowess. Would not only be a futile gesture, but ultimately end in Iwagakure's complete demise. The Yuan Daime alone had been enough to decimate their ranks, what would the Yuan Daime and his son, who bared the fabled Rinnegan, be capable of unleashing upon the still weakened ranks of the village? As soon as the 3S rank Ninja Plus guests arrived at the village gates, they were greeted by a four-man squad of Anbu. Even though there had been few casualties in the war against Odo, Minato had decided to up the security around the village, not only as a show of strength, but to stress that Kanoha would not stand for others making an attempt within its walls. 
the Ondaime Sama, Tenzu, and the other Anbu saluted the Hokage, and the other two shinobi with him. It is good to see you return home safe and sound. Shall we escort you three and you, guests, to your office? At the word guest, Minato turned to get a good look at the woman that had come with them. Kurosuchi was masking her fright well with a haughty expression and arrogant exterior, but it was not difficult to see that the woman was petrified. Of course, she had spent the better part of three weeks traveling with the man who had stomped a mud hole in her ass and killed an entire squad of Anbu, and now she was inside of the very walls her village's most hated enemies. She had a very good reason to be frightened. No, Minato said, turning his attention back to the Anbu. We'll be fine on our own. Who is on guard duty in the Hokage mansion? Neko, Yusagi, and Tor. A cat, a rabbit, and a bird, what a potentially violent combination, Naruto said with a snicker. Jirei masked his own laugh with a cough, while Minato sighed. Kurosuchi just gained an eye twitch. Thank you, return to your posts. With a final salute, the four Anbu members vanished, returning to their hidden positions around the gate. Minato turned to look at Naruto. Why don't you take Kurosuchi to your compound? Yureya and I will head over to inform Surutobi sama of our dealings with Iwa. Not to mention to relieve the man, before he busts a hip, Naruto opined with a chirp. He might not be as old as that old man, Inoki, but he still shouldn't doing too much work. Once more Jiraiya began coughing to hide his mirth, even Kurosuchi seemed to smirk at the blonde's crass way of speaking about authority figures, though her eye did twitch when he mentioned her grandfather, only she could call him old, while Minato just sighed. Yep, definitely gets his mouth from Kushina. You say that likes it a bad thing, Naruto said with a grin. And Kit-chan happens to like my mouth. I'm told it's quite talented, especially this one thing I do with my tongue. Okay, enough of that. Minato said, forcing his reddened cheeks to go down before people noticed. Jiraiya guffawed at his student, who cast an ineffectual glare at him. When that didn't work, he just turned away and mumbled, go escort her to where she'll be living. Jiraiya sensei, let's go. Naruto watched the pair leave with a grin on his face. He truly enjoyed teasing others on their insecurity. Why he hadn't noticed how fun it could be before he would never know. Turning to his companion, Naruto watched as Kurosuchi caught his eyes. Her smirk vanished and she jutted her chin out in defiance, only someone with incredible skills and observing the subtle differences in a person's demeanor would notice the fear in her eyes. Naruto was not that skilled yet, but he could smell the fear she was leaking with his enhanced senses, so it was a moot point. Come on, we should get going. I don't want to stand here looking like a lemon. Also, you may want to get rid of your headband while we talk to Konoha, I doubt you'd want to attract any unwanted attention. Kuritsuchi huffed. First you seal off my chakra, then you put that damn seal on me, then make me change into something a civilian would wear, and now you want me to take off my headband. How much humiliation can you make me suffer through? Despite her protesting words, she did do as told. Kuritsuchi wasn't stupid, people in Konoha hated people from Iwa, as much as Iwa hated Konoha. It was just the way things were, and parading the fact that she was from Iwa Gakure to the people of Konoha, would leave her in an even more vulnerable position than she already was. It's your own damn fault, Naruto replied in a casual tone, that pissed Kurosuchi off. He began walking away as the young woman pocketed her headband, forcing the pink-eyed Kanoichi to run to catch up. She looked at him with an indignant expression, but he just continued talking. Actually, I suppose I should say it's your grandfather's fault. After all, he was the one who sent you on that suicide mission. Kurosuchi looked away from the blonde. How were they to know that Naruto had the Rinnegan? Or that he had been the one to kill Orochimaru? Information on just what had occurred during the invasion had been sketchy at best, and the one spy they had within Konoha had been in no position to gain that kind of knowledge. Still, it wasn't like she could deny his words, so Kurosuchi kept silent as they walked through the village. Deciding to use her time wisely, the Iwagakure Jonin began taking in the sights of Konoha, turning her head this way and that. It had been a long time since anyone from her village had ever visited the famous village hidden in the leaves. In fact, the last person to visit had been Inoki before the First Great Shinobi War. Her actions didn't go unnoticed by Naruto, who decided to make conversation by commenting on them. So what do you think of our humble village? Kurosuchi snorted. Humble isn't the word I would use. Look at this place. She made a sweeping gesture as if to take in the whole of Konoha. You guys have it so good here, too good. No poverty, no food shortages, everyone's just walking around without a care in the world. The tree huggers just love lording your superiority over others. You think having a better looking village makes you better than us? Well it doesn't. Naruto watched, amused as the woman ranted and raved to him. She drew several curious stares, and a few disgruntled ones who heard her topic of conversation, but aside from, that she was ignored in favor of the blonde. Said man ignored the stares he was getting from the general populace. He didn't care how they looked at him, or what they thought of him, and while it would be beneficial for him to play up their psychophancy towards his father, it wasn't really Naruto's style. I think you're forgetting the amount of effort that went into making Kanoha what it is today, Naruto responded lightly, his tone the kind one might use when talking about what they were having for dinner that evening. 
This city was built upon the foundation set down by Senju Hashirima, the greatest shinobi of his time. The forest that surrounds us was said to have been given birth by his own hands as a gift to his people. Together with his brother, he built Konoha into the greatest village in the world. There was a disgruntled look on Kurosuchi's face when he mentioned Konoha being the greatest village in the world. But due to her fear of Naruto, she did not actually say anything to refute it. However, it's not like we don't have our problems. Konoha has its own red light district, and it's just as bad and poverty stricken as any other area of its kind in any other city. Crime runs rampant there, and the amount of drug dealing and prostitution that could be found in that area is gratuitous. We're just better at minimalizing those areas than your villages. Unlike Iwa, Kanoha actually allows those hiring it to come into the village for more than just the Chunin exams, so having an aesthetically pleasing village is something of a must. How do you know so much about Iwa? Asked Kurosuchi, randomly changing the topic, though whether that was from annoyance or curiosity the blonde could not determine. Did you get that from reading my mind too? It's not like that's not common knowledge, Naruto's voice held a tinge of amusement. Everyone who knows about the five great nations, knows that Iwagakure doesn't allow any of their clientele minus the daimyo to enter their village. It's at least half the reason you guys can't get as much work. Kurosuchi grit her teeth at the jab on her village, but remained silent. Truthfully, she agreed with him, but opening the village to foreigners was not an option. With how weak their village still was, allowing people they didn't know and didn't trust to enter their village was asking for trouble. And the last thing they needed, was for more of their shinobi to die, or God help them their infrastructure to collapse, because they got careless. And no, I didn't need to pull that little bit of information out of your mind. Just the stuff about your village's infrastructure, its hierarchy, the number of shinobi you possess. Naruto trailed off, almost grinning when he saw the look of pale fear on the woman's face. Yeah, so you probably shouldn't try searching for any weaknesses in my village's infrastructure. You not only won't find them, but it would be a damn shame if I had to use all the information I stole from that pretty little hat of yours to destroy Iwa. You would be breaking the treaty. Kurosuchi tried, only to be cut off with a laugh. I wouldn't be breaking the treaty if you were the one trying to find a weakness to my village that you could sense the old kudan I was thrown for him to exploit, now would I? Kurosuchi quickly turned her head to look away, causing Naruto's smile to whiten. Well, this has been a pleasant conversation, but I think we should be heading to your new home for the unforeseeable future. Sa, so, let's go. Kurosuchi followed Naruto, her head bowed in slight defeat. The rest of the trip was made in silence. Birth of the new demon king. Ah, Minato-kun. Sarutobi said as the man in question appeared from behind the office doors, followed quickly by Jiraiya. I take it the negotiations went well. They did, Minato said with a small smile of satisfaction. It was the closest he would ever come to a smirk. They went exactly how we expected them to. Inoki acted just like he told me he would. MMM, Sarutobi nodded in agreement as he stood up from the cage's chair and allowed Minato to occupy it, while he went over to the small couch located near the images of the four Hokages. He sat down heavily and reached into his robes for his pipe. Inoki is a very predictable man these days, Sarutobi said as he placed the pipe in his mouth and lit the tobacco that was already packed into it with a small application of fire nature chakra. And when you get to know someone as well as I know Inoki, that predictability can become a hazard, especially when the person who knows your habits best just happens to be your enemy. You and Inoki were rivals during the first and second great wars, weren't you? We were indeed, Sarutobi leaned back on the couch and took a deep puff of smoke. He released it in a small cloud over his head, the white substance creating a thin stream of haze before dissipating. Inoki and I fart many times over the course of our lives. He is the oldest living shinobi in the world, and the only man to have fought against the Chiha Madara and still live. He's wily, but stubborn to a fault, and approaches many of his problems in a predictable manner once you understand his use of subterfuge. With a nod of acknowledgement towards the older man's words, Minato said, Well we got what we wanted out this. Iwagakure won't be able to risk attacking us now. Your idea to disguise our true demands, by giving the Tsuchikakure an outrageous list of demands worked perfectly. I don't even think he realized he was being played until after he had already signed the treaty. And by then it was too late, Jureya added with a grin. So how has Konoha been in my absence, asked Minato. Quite, Sirtobi joked. Without you and Naruto-kun making waves, there has not been much in the way of excitement. The three shared a small chuckle, before the San Daime decided to give a more thorough report. The new policy you've implemented for the Shinobi Academy has officially started. I suspect that, while many of the students will drop out once we hit them with the hard truth about being a shinobi, those who do not quit will be of a lot better quality. But, Minato said decisively. The last thing we need is for Konoha's shinobi to be nothing but cannon fodder. What about the police force? The police force is still not ready for deployment, Sarutobi commented as he watched Minato begin searching for the files on his desk. The reports of the past month are the second pile on your left. When the blonde Kage reached for the first file, the Sandaime began again. 
though he actually sent projects that they will be ready within the next six months. Their ranks are beginning to fill out nicely, already 100 of our ninja are being given a position within the police force. Once the police station is built, they will be ready. Good, good. And what of the two elders? Kaharu and Mitakado. While the elders don't seem to please with having their powers taken away, the seminars are proving fruitful. There was mirth in Sir Toby's voice, no doubt deriving pleasure from his two former teammates' plight. I believe that the knowledge we are imparting on our ninja will help curb the civilians' attempts at subverting them for their own use. And those who continue to try will be caught in the act and apprehended before they can say Hokage, Jiraiya said. I have to admit, it's a rather ingenious way of catching those few counselors who were slippery enough to use our own shinobi forces for their illegal business without us ever catching on. Taking the compliment to his plan with a smile, Minato asked about the person he was most cautious of. And what about Danzo? Quiet as a mouse, Sir Toby replied quickly, as if he knew the subject had been coming up. Knowing him, he probably did. The new training method has been officially implemented into his forces, and while still more brutal than what our Ambu go through, it is leagues better than how I suspect he was training them. Minato nodded at that, already having an idea on the kind of training Danzo put his forces through. Unlike most people, who preferred their shinobi to have more independent thoughts, so they could think out of the box. The old Warhawk preferred breaking his shinobi and turning them into emotionless weapons. It was not only a cruel training method, but didn't allow the ninja in question to reach their full potential. Sighing, Minato leaned back in his chair, and closed his eyes. Catching up on 12 years worth of knowledge in so short a time was insanely difficult. Even with the use of the Kage bunch and no jutsu it was hard. Combine that with the many new plans he had implemented, while well, the council was left flat-footed along with the issues with Iwagakure and you had the makings of one major headache. As things were, he was still only 8 years into the recent history of the going-ons, of what had happened after his death. It's more respite over with, Minato opened his eyes and gazed at Sir Toby with a penetrating look. While he was still not caught up with the most recent history of the elemental nations, there is one thing he had read that had him puzzled. Sir Toby-sama, what can you tell me about the Ichiha massacre? Birth of the new demon king. Naruto and Kurosuchi arrived at the blonde male's new home, and her new prison to the sounds of laughter. Ha, sounds like Anko-chan is here, Naruto said as he led the way into the living room. His assumption was proven correct when they saw Anko sitting on one of the couches, a bottle of sake in hand, as she told Kin and Teiwaya about one of her more brutal torturing sessions. And then I acted like I was going to begin rubbing my body all over the asshole. He had actually been looking excited, right until my snake spit him on the cock, and made his entire dick shrivel like a piece of bacon that's been left in the oven for far too long. Neither Taewaya nor Kin looked particularly pleased with what they were hearing, Kin more so than Taewaya. Both had turned green, and Naruto thought they might vomit at any second now. At the same time, they looked like they were about to laugh. It was clear that their amusement over some prisoner getting his just deserts was warring with their disgust at the vivid details in which Anko told her story. Sitting on a couch a few feet away from the trio of girls, Kyubi silently read a book of some kind, her feet drawn under her ear. Occasionally, she would glance over at the trio, and smiling when Anko gave a particularly disturbing piece of imagery, but she otherwise said nothing. When Naruto entered the room with his new housemate, she was the first one to notice his presence. Welcome back, Naruto-sama, the red-haired demoness greeted as she used a book holder to keep her place and closed the book shut with a snap. She set it aside, stood up, and walked over to Naruto before giving him a kiss that had all four other females in the room blushing. When she pulled back, making extra sure to dip her tongue into his mouth to grab the saliva that connected their mouths, she grinned. Did you have a prosperous trip? Naruto almost shook his head at Kyuubi's not-so-subtle reminder of who the woman of this house was. It definitely had its benefits, the blonde replied as he took a step to the side to reveal Kurosuchi to the others in the room. We managed to get a new house guest. Finding herself the center of attention for everyone in the room, Kurosuchi almost shrank in on herself. Almost. With a sniff of derision and a straightening of her spine, the young Iwagakure Jonin puffed up her chest and jutted her chin out, glaring at everyone in the room with a defiant gaze. Reactions varied. Kyubi looked like she was struggling with a combination of amusement and anger. Anko just looked amused, grinning as she was. Kin and Teiwaya, however, just looked plain confused. So who's the bitch, and why does she look like someone just shoved a 40-foot long pole up her ass? The insulting comment made by the house's resident foul-mouthed red hat caused Anko to break out in laughter and Kyubi to actually smile, for once, deciding not to threaten Teiwaya for her terrible use of language. Kurtsuchi, the wind taken out of her sails, glared at the red-haired girl with a fierce and confrontational look. What hell did you just say? What? Are you deaf as well as constipated? Teiwai taunted. Yo? You? Kurosuchi's face twisted in a rictus of rage. Her face was beginning to turn red, not in embarrassment, but in anger. It would only be so long before the mountain of fury exploded, the results of which would likely be disastrous for all those involved. 
Fortunately, Naruto was able to head off the impending shitstorm before it could get started. Tewaya, go to your room. You're grounded. Tewaya's eyes bulge. What? You are grounded, Naruto said, emphasizing each word very slowly, as if he were speaking to a five-year-old. You will go to your room and stay in there until I decide you can come out. Tewaya grumbled. The blonde's enhanced ears picked up the redhead swearing as she stomped out of the room. As the girl's loud footsteps began receding, Naruto added something else as an afterthought. Oh, and Kin can't go in and keep you company. Kin blushed a pretty shade of red before fleeing the scene, while Tewaya's expletives became even louder. Naruto just chuckled as he watched the raven-haired girl scurry from the room. I'm really going to have to do something about that girl's mouth, Kyubi said with a sigh. I'm sure you can beat the swearing out of her once Tusan gets the training ground set up, Naruto replied lightly. The grin on he received from Kyubi was as beautiful as it was terrifying. Kurosuchi seemed to think so too, because the moment it sprang into existence on the woman's face, she instinctively shrunk back so as not to be the recipient of it. Of course, like a predator attracted to movement, Kurosuchi's action caused Kyubi to turn her gaze to her. Kurosuchi froze as the red-haired beauty's brilliant crimson orbs pierced her own pink ones. Kyubi's eyes always had a way of making others feel naked and vulnerable around her, and the Iwagakure Jonin was no different. She stood stock still as the enviously perfect woman gazed upon her with a look one might have when eating a piece of meat. Hmm, so this is the one that tried to kill you, asked Kyubi. Kurosuchi's form went stiff, but she ignored that and turned to Naruto. Naruto shrugged. The only one not sleeping six feet under anyways. Kurosuchi bristled at the casual way he mentioned killing her comrades. Still, there was little she could do, and expressing that displeasure in any way shape or form would not be conducive to her continued health. She kept silent. Kyubi nodded. She gazed at the woman for several seconds longer, watching in satisfaction as Kurosuchi squirmed uncomfortably. Eventually, she smiled. Well, why don't I show Orna, guest to her room. The way she emphasized room did not bode well for Kurosuchi, who shuddered noticeably at the word room. Come along, Kurosuchi, Kyubi said as she began walking away. Follow me as I show you to your room, and enlighten you about the rules of this house. But one final shudder, Kurosuchi followed Kyubi, leaving Naruto and Anko alone. So how have you been, Anko-chan, asked Naruto as he turned his gaze away from the hallway Kyubi and Kurosuchi had just left to look at the only woman, to have not left the room. Anko, suddenly feeling very shy and unsure of herself, seemed to find far more interest in the strange pattern her foot was making in the carpet. I've been alright, she said lowly, and were it not for Naruto's enhanced hearing, he might not have heard it at all. Well there hasn't been a whole lot happening since you left, there were a few exciting moments. Then as an added mumble in an even lower voice, added, some moments were more exciting than others. Naruto tilted his head at the odd comment, but didn't say anything as he studied the woman before him. It was a remarkable contrast from the way she usually reacted. Unko was rarely ever anything but loud, enthusiastic, and slight sarcastic with a side of sadism that any demon would find appealing. There were moments when that changed, where she was gentle, caring and had a much softer demeanor, usually when they were alone. But this was a marked difference from both of those personalities that he was used to. It reminded him of the time she woke up in his room after giving him her first kiss and crying her eyes out. Naruto bent over slightly, so he could stare into a pair of steel gray eyes that refused to meet his own. Are you okay? Of course, Unko said, jerking her head back up. I've never been better, just thinking is all. Ah ha 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 ha. Her laughter started out loud, but quickly trailed off after a few seconds. She sighed and her shoulders seemed to slump slightly. I guess you could say I'm a little nervous, she admitted. As she spoke, her left arm reached out and her hand gabbed her right arm at the elbow, where she began to unconsciously rub the appendage up and down. Nervous. Naruto's face adopted an expression of general confusion. Nervous about what? About something I wanted to ask you, Anko hesitated, she seemed to be teetering on the edge of saying something that was, apparently important, and bolting for the door as quickly as she could. She looked almost like a caged animal of some kind. Or perhaps an animal, that was about to be caged, but didn't want to would be a more accurate depiction. You don't have to feel nervous when talking to me, Anko-chan, Naruto spoke up reassuringly. I've never laughed at anything you've said, unless it was meant to be funny, never told you off for any reason and I won't do so now. So tell me what's bothering you please. Anko nodded at his words. They were all true, Naruto had never treated her in any manner other than respect. When around him, she could be herself without reservations or worries, she didn't have to put up the facade of barely constrained violence that she used to keep others away. She didn't have to protect herself around him. She took a deep breath, her cheeks gaining a red tint. Would you like to go on a date with me? Naruto blinked. I'm sorry, what did you say? Anko blushed, no doubt realizing she had spoken so fast that Naruto likely hadn't understood a word she had just said. She would be right too. I want. She started, then shook her head. Taking a deep breath, Anko started over, using a much slower voice. Would you like to go on a date with me? 
Bunko felt a second of uncertainty when Naruto stood there, staring at her with a slightly befuddled expression, as if he had not heard a word she had spoke. The moment didn't last, however, when a glint of understanding entered the blonde's eye. He relaxed, and allowed a smile to grace his lips. Is that all you wanted, he asked, a surprising amount of relief in his voice. Uncle looked at him suspiciously. What did you think I wanted? I'm not sure. With you one never knows, he said, tossing her a teasing wink and grin. In spite of herself, Anko grinned back. It soon faded when she realized that he had not answered her question. So? She trailed off, clearly wanting an answer, but not sure how hard she should push for it. While she and Naruto had done many things together, from blowing up training grounds, much to the displeasure of the work crews whose job is to repair said training grounds, to watching movies in her apartment, she had never considered it as anything more than a meeting between friends. And while a part of it was because of the novelty of simply having a male friend, another was because Kid had staked her claim on him. Naruto smiled at her. I would love to go on a date with you. Really? Anko perked up. When Naruto confirmed that, yes, he would love to go on a date with her, Anko gave him a smile that could have powered the whole of Kanoha for a month. She left not long after that, but not before having Naruto promise to give her the best first date she could ever ask for. With no one left to occupy his attention in the living room, Naruto made his way to his own bedroom. Kyubi was already there, sitting on the bed and using the head as her support to lean against as she read. Now that there was nothing going on, Naruto got a good look at the book, and noticed it was in a language he was not familiar with, but the runic symbols drawn upon it were definitely demonic in origin, leading him to believe it was something she had taken with her after returning from Makai. Shaking the irrelevant thought away, Naruto walked into the room, his steps light on the carpet. Did you and Anko have a pleasant conversation? Apparently not light enough to stop him from being noticed, however, as Kyubi had not even taken her eyes off the book. She flipped through another page, a perennial smile on her face. He spoke with Anko about joining us, Naruto accused. I did, Kyubi replied with a shirk. There was no point in denying her involvement, he would smell her pheromones if she was lying. Not that she ever intended to lie to her mate. Why? Asked Naruto, feeling not only put out, but more than a little angry. You knew I was going to speak with her myself. Why would you go behind my back like this? Kyubi hit her wince well as she closed the book, and set it down. His accusations hurt, but she didn't let him onto that, instead choosing to address him in a mild manner. I don't think I went behind your back, Naruto-sama. I know you wanted to speak with her, but I felt it would be better if she heard it from me. A look of confusion crossed his face, breaking through the stern expression for a brief second. Kyubi used that small window to explain her reasoning further. While I do not understand human relationships as well as I probably should, I do know from interacting with women like Kurenai-sen that most human women find the idea of taking more than one mate appalling. Kyubi paused for a moment, collecting her thoughts. Their reasons are very different from the reasons I might find, being in a harem appalling. Where mine would be because of pride, Kurenai's is because of her belief that being with a man who has taken multiple lovers is degrading to the women involved. I myself don't necessarily understand that, but I do know that the idea of being a part of a harem does not sit well with her. That being said, I thought it might avoid a potential blow up if I'm the one who spoke with any potential harem members. Naruto sighed, he hated it when Kyubi used logic on him. When combined with the look she was giving him, any anger he tried to dredge up just went away. Next time, please talk to me before you decide to do something like this, he said, running a hand through his hair in a tired manner. Of course, Naruto-sama Kyubi replied with a smile. I promise, from now on I'll talk to you first. Thanks. Naruto began moving again, reaching the bed with long strides. As he did, Naruto shed his clothing, dropping them on the floor, before he reached the bed. He pulled back the covers and climbed in, Kyubi sliding down the bed as she did. By the time Naruto was laying down, the red-headed firmly implanted herself into his side, her naked body pressing against him in the most pleasurable of ways. Do you really find the idea of being in a harem appalling? Asked Naruto. Kyubi lifted her head, confusion flitting across her gaze, before she remembered what she had said during her reasoning, of why she had talked to Anko and not him. It's not so much that I find much that I find being in a harem appalling, and more along the lines of the fact that the last time I was in a harem, I had been treated like dirt. Kyubi's eyes were open as she spoke, laying her head on Naruto's chest, and listening to the rhythmic pumping of his heart. She watched as one of her fingers drew absent circles along the blonde's well-defined left pectoral. As I said before, I had been the 15th wife of one of the Kitsune clan's more powerful members. After I had done my duty to the clan, I was tossed aside and ignored. It didn't help matters that, when I came back from my foray into the human world with nine tails, that my husband actually did try to take me as a mate. She heard Naruto's growl and smiled. I showed him why he shouldn't mess with me, so you don't need to worry about that. However, his actions did leave a bitter taste in my mouth towards harems. Even though I suggested it to you, I'm still not very comfortable with it. 
Kyubi sighed as she closed her eyes. She hated admitting to weakness, but at the same time, it felt good to let someone know of her feelings. I guess a part of me is still afraid of being thrown aside. Before she knew what was happening, Kyubi found herself being rolled onto her back, and not long after, that a pair of lips were holding her own in a soul-searing kiss. Kyubi felt her toes curl as stars exploded behind her head. By the time the kiss had ended, her face was lightly flushed, and she was breathing much more heavily than usual. She looked up into the sky-blue eyes of her mate, his face was mere millimeters from her own. So close their noses lightly grazed and bumped each other. So close she could feel his warm breath hitting her lips, causing her body to shudder with repressed desire. I will never throw you away, Kyubi Haim, Naruto stated, the conviction in his voice surprising the woman in question. A hand moved up to cup her face, the blonde's thumb lightly ran over her flawless cheeks. Kyubi purred as she leaned into the large, calloused hand while Naruto continued talking. Even though we decided on letting other women enter, family, you will always be my first. My alpha. His words brought a smile to Kyubi's face. She leaned up ever so slightly, closing the distance between the two of them. Their lips connected again. Kyubi's hands went from their place lying on either side of her to burying themselves in Naruto's hair. As her fingers threaded through his locks, the hand Naruto had placed on her face began to move. Slowly, it glided across her silken skin, its inexorable path brought it to the demoness left breast. A moan escaped Kyubi's mouth, muffled by the lips that were pressed against hers. Naruto used the opening to penetrate her oral passage. As his tongue began to explore the depths of her mouth, Kyubi began to fight back, bringing her own tongue to the fore and pushing it against her mates. What had once been a tender moment of kisses and caresses soon became a heated battle of passion. It was moments like these that Kyubi realized she was glad with the way things had turned out. Thinking back on it, if given the knowledge of what would happen in the future back then, she would not have changed a thing. Had none of her horrible experiences in the past happened, had she never been sealed inside of Mido and then Kashina, she would have never met this amazing man. Birth of the New Demon King While Naruto was having the night of his life, Namikaze Minato was beginning to wonder if he should follow in Sanade Haim's footsteps and begin taking up alcohol, but for no other reason than to stop the coming headache that threatened to split his skull. I had thought something was off about those reports the moment I read them, Minato said, rubbing his forehead in a futile attempt to ward off the coming headache. I remember Itachi when he was a child, Mikoto would often bring him over whenever she wanted to spend time with Kishina. In spite of his genius and prodigal talents in the shinobi arts, he was a very gentle kid, extremely considerate and kind-hearted, a pacifist in every sense of the word. Hmm. Saratobi mumbled in agreement, his pipe long since spent and forgotten lying on the table beside the couch. He looked tired, with bags under his eyes and a sense of regret hanging about him. Itachi-kun was always one to avoid violence whenever possible. He hated the idea of killing, and when he had no other choice, he made his kills as quick and painless as possible. I believe it was the traumatic experience of witnessing the Third Great Shinobi War, and the countless deaths that followed at such a young age. No one should be forced to witness that much death at the age of four. Minato nodded his head. I do remember that. He was at a small outlying village with his mother, wasn't he? I believe they had there, in order to escape the war for a while. It was on the outer edges of Hainil Kuni, and nowhere near the borders of either Iwagakure or Kumagakure. Which was why Iwa decided to attack there, Jureya added in. The white-haired man had mostly been silent, having already known much of the information, being presented to Minato and merely there to give support when needed. It was out of the way and Kanoha would have never suspected Iwa to attack there. They had managed to catch us flat-footed. He looked over at his revived student. Had you not unveiled the Horatian when you did, they would have overrun us within days. The blonde-haired Hokage acknowledged Jureya's point before returning to their previous topic. I was lucky to have found him. He had gotten separated from Makoto at some point, and was being attacked by several ninja. By the time I rescued him, he had gone into a state of shock. To be honest, I was always surprised at how he had managed to continue functioning in society without losing his sanity. Itachi-kun has always possessed an iron will, Sirotobi stated, the pride in his voice only overshadowed by the regret lacing his words. I remember explaining war one time to Itachi after that incident, and how horrible it was. Husbands die, never to return to their wives and children. Sons and daughters are taken before their time. Loved ones are constantly lost, never to return. I believe Itachi understood that better than anyone, which is why he was so determined to be the best shinobi he could. He wanted to protect the people he loved, and find some way to achieve peace, so that the atrocities he witnessed would never happen again. Yet he could not stop the Ichiha massacre, Jureya stated. Sir Toby sighed. I am beginning to believe no one could have stopped that massacre. After the Kyubi attack many of our shinobi became fearful and distrusting of the Ichiha clan. It is well known, that Ichiha Madara was capable of controlling the Nine Tails, and that he had summoned it to battle against Senju Hashirima during their final battle. That mistrust and fear ostracized the Ichiha clan to the point where they believed the only way to regain their pride and standing was to become the ones who ruled Kanoha. 
Upon learning of this, Itachi was forced to kill his clan and flee the village as a missing ninja. He accepted the fact that he would become hated and reviled by his own people in order to keep the village safe. He was a true shinobi possessing the will of fire. Leaning back in his chair, Minato's mind went over what he had learned with speeds that rivaled the Horation. One thing that bothers me about all this is that, while Itachi had great potential to be a shinobi, I don't see how he could have taken out the Ichiha clan all on his own. Sir Toby frowned. What do you mean? Just think about it, Minato said. Itachi was just one man, and well I know from what you told me, that he became an extremely powerful shinobi, one man cannot destroy an entire clan in a single night. Do you suspect he had help? Asked Sir Toby, frowning as he thought over the fourth words. I do, Minato stated with the utmost conviction. I believe he may have had help from the masked man who had released the Kyubi from Kushina-chan and used the Sharingan to control it. Minato was quick to cover his small slip of the tongue in almost calling Kyubi her. No one but himself, Tewaya and Kin actually knew of Kyubi's true identity, and revealing it under any circumstances would cause disastrous results, even if he did trust Jiraiya and Saratobi with his life. Thankfully, Minato was skilled enough that neither noticed his slip-up. Both Saratobi and Jiraiya looked pensive upon hearing his statement. If you what you say is true, then it looks like Kanoha, possibly even the entirety of the elemental nations is in grave danger from a threat we are not ready to face. The grim smile crossed Minato's face at those words. He gave a rueful chuckle, confusing the two until he said, well the elemental nations might not be truly prepared. I know one person who may be able to turn the tides of any battle that may be fought against that man. His two counterparts for the night both blinked. Who are you talking about? Asked Sir Toby, unable to contain his curiosity. Minato's smile widened just a fraction. A powerful shinobi who has yet to even reach his prime. Birth of the new demon king. Lying on his back with Kyubi laying directly on his chest and holding him in a possessive manner, Uzumaki Naruto let out a sneeze. His nose wrinkled a bit, wiggling as if trying to scratch an itch. A few seconds later, his movements settled down. Neither he nor his mate woke up, both sleeping on peacefully after several intense rounds of lovemaking. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want the next part of this video, like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification and also check out the other videos that I have created and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.